Well, good evening. Uh, this is great. My, my name is uh, Gene Anderson. I'm the, I'm the dean of the business school, and uh, it's really my great pleasure. I get to say great pleasure a lot, but this time I really, really mean this is my great pleasure <laughs> to welcome all of you to, uh, to, to the reverse mentoring kickoff reception. I'm very excited about, about tonight and about, about getting this program started. Um, I would especially like to, uh, to welcome our guests from City who are, who are here this evening. Uh, thanks uh, to all of you for being a part of this exciting new program. Uh, what, one of the, as many of you may know, one of the top priorities of the school is to provide experiential learning opportunities for our students that help them to, uh, to connect the dots between uh, the theory they're learning in the classroom and, and what it's really like out there in the, in the real world. Um, and also give them an opportunity to develop, uh, you know, their leadership skills and the, and the soft skills that we all know are going to be so important to their success in the future. And so programs like this are really important to, to doing that. So, so thank you so much for, for helping us to achieve those goals. Um, I'd also like to welcome all of the students that have decided to uh, to participate in the in in this in this great program this pilot program. Um, I think you've made a great choice by committing to be a part of this. Uh, my hope is that you're going to find this experience to be a, a, a really rewarding one, not just in terms of, of what you learn, but also through the experience of sharing your, your own expertise and perspective with the senior leaders with whom you're, you're going to be matched. And I hope you find that, that kind of teaching and sharing to be something that, that you really enjoy and love because I think it's something that, uh, that that's an aspect of, uh, of, of being in business and helping to develop the talent around you that, uh, that you've really got to embrace embrace um, if you really want to be successful in the long run, if you want the organizations you work for to be successful in the long run. Uh, before we begin, I, I want to take a moment to acknowledge uh, a few of the, the really special individuals that have, uh, have made this new program possible. Um, in particular, I want, I want to call out uh, Jorge Ruiz. Uh, where's, where's, where's Jorge? He's, he's, he's over here. Um, it was his... his more or less his, his brainchild, um, and he was reminding me that he proposed this uh, when we were watching a basketball game together. It was the, it was the Duke game, um, but it really got my attention. A anyways, I, I actually tore me away from Duke. I was very excited about, 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 about it. Um, uh, I also want to, want to thank, I understand we've got a couple people here who've worked very hard to, uh, to coordinate all of this from the, from the Citibank side with, with, our, with our staff here. So um, Cecilia uh, Marcono. Uh, is 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 here? Thank you, <laughs> Cecilia. And and Itziar Diaz uh, Canedo. Did I have that? Very, very, I'm still. I've only been in Miami for a couple of years, and I'm still working on my pronunciation. So, so thank you, thank you for bearing with me. Um, but thank you so much for all you've done to uh, to, to bring this program together. Um, we're thrilled to be partnering with with, with City on on yet another initiative. Um, we do we do a lot of things uh, with 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 Citibank. Um, you know, this one is is focused on on new technologies and and changing industry dynamics and and trends in consumer employee behavior. And so we're very excited to be working on those topics. But, um, and, and we're also very excited to be working with this particular unit of city. Uh, another one of our top priorities is, is, is to face south. Um, we really want the school to engage with Latin America on, on all levels. Uh, many of you know we've got uh, several programs that we've launched in the last couple of years, like the, like the Global MBA, which is taught entirely in Spanish to, uh, to Latin American executives. And, and we're bringing a new EMBA online uh, next year that will, uh, has kind of a, a once every two months format that will bring uh, executives from all over Latin America here to here to Miami. So we're thrilled to be uh, in a partnership with this like like like, like this one uh, with a, with a unit that's also focused on Latin America. Um, we do a lot of things with City, as as many of you may know. Um, we have City executives come frequently into our classrooms to speak. Um, we have a very strong recruiting relationship that we've that we've developed over the over the years. We have nearly 50 uh, canes that have been been hired by 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 City over the past several years, and um, we, we even have an alumni network up in up in New York who uh, is very excited to call themselves City Canes. Um, and uh, and so we're very proud to have gotten to the point where we have we we actually have a uh, a, a, a branded network within within city. That's that's really great for us. Um, so so to our friends from who are here from city again, once again, thank you uh, for for helping us to make make this new uh, initiative and this new part of our partnership and relationship happen. So I'd now like to turn it over to 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 uh, Ariel Ragotki, 
who is the talent management head for, for City Latin America, and he will get the, uh, the, the, the kickoff started. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dean Anderson, for your words and for your partnership. You know, uh, this partnership with University of Miami is, is very important for us. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Where are you? Oh, there you are. Thank you, Mary, for, for helping us, you know, bring this to life, and, and Lucia as well for making this happen. You know, and as Dean Anderson said, you know, uh, Ceci and, and Itier, you know, have been working very, very hard, you know, from on the city side to, to make this possible. Thank you for leading this. Uh, um, I'd like to, to actually share a story with you. Um, instead of making you know, a long presentation, I'm going to share with you a very short story that I think it's a good reflection of what we try to accomplish with this reverse mentoring program. And basically, this story is a story that happens at night, very you know, dark, late night, um, in a dark street. And there's, there's a police officer that comes by and actually sees a man you know, looking for something uh, under a street light. So imagine this, you know, very, very dark, you know, alley, you know, and there's a street light and there's someone there. So the police officer, you know, approach this man and actually ask, well, what are you doing? What are you doing here? He says, well, I actually lost my keys and I'm looking for my keys. He says, okay, do you need any help? You know, I'm going to help you with, with finding your keys. So they started looking, you know, and searching, you know, around, you know, this little space, you know, with the light, um, with the street light. And after a few minutes, the police officer asked the man, are you sure you've dropped your keys right here? He says, well, I'm not sure if I drop it right here. What I'm sure is that I drop it somewhere, you know, in, on this street. So why are you looking just here? He says, well, this is where the light is. Okay. I think that this represents very much, you know, the problem we are trying to solve with reverse mentoring. We typically feel very comfortable, you know, looking for solutions in those places that are familiar for us. You know, and we are very limited, you know, from our own mental models and our own experience in terms of, you know, what kind, you know, of solutions we can find and where we can find them. This program is really about partnering, you know, a student with a senior executive you know, trying to help both of you, actually, to see the world with different lenses, you know, and expand, you know, your horizons, expand the place where you can find, you know, these kind of solutions. Hopefully, you know, with this cross-generational dialogue, you're going to be able to do exactly that, you know, broaden your perspectives, broaden your mindset, you know, and hopefully you'll feel uh, like having a flashlight, in your hands in order to be able to find keys you know, to the solutions you're looking, not just under the um, street light, but actually you know, throughout the, the alley. So I want to leave you with that message. You know, it might look you know, very uh, existential, but I think that this will really help you to see things in a different perspective. So thank you so much for your commitment, for being here. You know, I hope you can take full advantage of um, this opportunity uh, that UM is, is providing all of us. You know. um, so thank you so much for being here. And I'm going to pass the microphone uh, to Professor Bolton, you know, who's going to share with us some you know, ideas, some you know, thought thoughts around social networking and digital trends. Thank you. Um, it's like talk about the universe in 10 minutes. Uh, <laughs> it's easy to do. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about digital media. And uh, the great thing about talking about the future is nobody can ever prove that you're wrong. So I'd like to talk on that side of the fence as opposed to talk about things that currently exist. There is a media revolution going on out there of which you probably are aware. Um, it is part of a thing that we're witnessing, which is probably the largest increase in expressive capability in human history. Think about it. The largest increase in expressive capability in human history. It's a world where people can not only consume media, but it's a world where people can create media. And that's something new. It's because all media has been digitized. And once it was digitized, it changed everything. Here's a little history of what took place. There were three phases of which this revolution took place. 
The first began with the printing press, where it was one-way communication. It was that type of uh, interactive system that was set up. Then along came radio, television, and to even a certain extent, the first part of the internet, whereby we had two-way communication. Suddenly, once we got in our hands or in our pockets mobile communication, it became my way communication. Everybody has a voice. Everybody has the opportunity to create content. Not only can you create content, but you can create it for free. It doesn't get any cheaper than that, almost for free. This interconnectivity has created this massive expressive capability and it's on a global level, everywhere. I'm going to show you some slides. You've seen these before because it, it's mind-boggling to a certain extent. Which of the social media do you use? This just gives you a comparative sense of where Facebook is relative to other social forms of media uh, and where they have to go in order to reach their level of penetration. This is adoption rates of Facebook. This only goes up to uh, 2010. I think they're up to about 850 million right now in terms of uh, global audience. It's a pretty fast adoption rate, wouldn't you say? <coughs> this is time spent on social media. That's 85% time spent on social media just with Facebook. You can see what photos, what percentage of Facebook is relative to people uploading photos. This is the daily number of photos uploaded and shared in the course of 2013, year to date, half a billion a day. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? And it's true. And it's going to get larger. Digital media was supposed to be the great democracy, where everybody would have a voice. And in fact, it's turned out to be the exact opposite of that. It's become the great monopoly. There are five companies that control the digital universe. Right? <clears throat> this is YouTube. This is the number of videos uploaded per minute. Per minute. It's going on right now. We may be uploaded <laughs> as we're speaking. <laughs> this is a snapshot of a service that monitors Twitter mentions while a TV <coughs> broadcast is going on. You can see that it peaks sometime around 10 o'clock. You can see the numbers at the top, the number of tweets which occurred during television programming. Check this out. I don't know if you're, this is one of your favorite programs. 1.9 million tweets during the program, 70,000 per minute. Per minute. Thinking of making this my new business card. <laughs> it, it, it's it's mind-boggling that media has become a level playing ground from Hollywood to Homestead and everywhere in between. Anybody can create, anybody can consume. There is, however, one universal truth that I think is true in the digital media universe. They don't click on boring. They don't. There's a lot of junk out there. But the stuff and the hard stuff is going to be media, digital media, that isn't boring. So my question to the group today, is this an issue of technology? Is that what we're talking about? Or instead we're talking, because we know technology creates people and it moves data from one point to another. That's what technology does. It's going to get better. It's going to get faster. It's going to change in, in a year. We know that. The great content moves what matters most. And what matters most are the hearts and the minds of your customers. And there's an old saying in marketing. If you move the heart, the feet usually follow. Content is king, in my opinion. Those people who can create great content will be the masters of the digital universe because they don't click on boring. We know technology will change, but great content will continue to be terrific content. So, do we need technology scientists? Is that what we need more of? Or do we need filmmakers and, and storytellers and creative content people who create great content? That's the hard part. 
people with this thing called an expressive capability in a digital world. That's the challenge before you tonight, I think, and as you move into the future. Here's some of the challenges I think that, that any organization has to deal with as they move forward in any type of digital media marketing program. You have to capture people's attention with great content. They don't click on boring. You have to be responsive and transparent. You can't throw social media out there and pretend like it doesn't exist and not respond to it. It's live. You've got to respond. And you have to be completely transparent. You can't be trying to hide behind walls. You have to inform and you have to entertain. Can the financial industry be entertaining? I think it can be. There's a lot of entertaining things that could go on. Lots. <laughs> Lots. You have to change your mind around a little bit, but yeah, they're not going to click on you if you're boring. You have to let the customers drive the bus. You can't control them. You can't control what they do. If they set up user groups that are in opposition to the things that you stand for, they will exist. You cannot stop them. You have to act human, and you have to express real human emotion. And you have to be true to your brand, whatever your brand promise is to your consumers. So here are some possible strategies as we move into the future. Here's one. Just hope it all goes away. <laughs> this gives new meaning to drinking and texting. Um, or you can go directly to the source. These people consume media. Do all of you have an uh, iPhone bowl? <laughs> They consume media in ways on a daily basis. Here's the data to support that. This is uh, just from 2011, and you can see the lines here. And the bottom lines are all the people that work at Citibank. And the top, not really, I'm joking. The top people, <laughs> the, the top line are 18 to 29 years old, which is the group of people who will be uh, involved in this great program. Um, that line, I think, is changing a little bit, but there's no question about it that those people over the age of 50 or 45 just aren't as socially media involved. They're not eating and digesting uh, social media the way young people are. Thus, this program, which I think is a, a terrific idea and one that uh, I hope will use both sides of the brain, not only the technology side, but also that you guys will be in the business of creating some great, memorable content. Thank you. Enjoyed it. Can I turn this on? Is it on already? What's that? Well, what Ted said is extremely interesting because now the idea is how can we use what each is shared with us in terms of the financial book, right? And that's what we're going to talk about today, which is five minutes, no more than that. Generation X, raise your hands, Generation X. Just a few. All right, good. And Generation Y. There you go. So that's what we're talking about today, right? Which is how can we combine those two generations? Because as we just heard, the world is changing. And it's changing dramatically, right? And, and, and we just... Uh, saw a few stats on this, and uh, Google, for example, 2 million ser searches every 60 seconds. And when I was looking at these numbers uh, this afternoon, I think it's working. Sometimes uh, in city, we, we tend to think that we do a lot of transactions, a lot of things every day, and a lot of things uh, towards the end of the year, right? We, we say we do 50 million transactions a year. But look at those numbers. Look at how they, they uh, they perform in 60 seconds. So it's incredible, no? the amount of information, <coughs> the amount of transactions that are happening as we speak, and that obviously have something to do with us on a daily basis. Uh, Snapchat is a great example. How many of you here use Snapchat? Okay, how many of you are X? Nobody, okay, that's an interesting thing, see, is how how people are using, there's 104,000 Snapchats used per 60 seconds and only Y generation are using it. That's telling us something, right? X are not using 
snapshot. That's that's interesting because now when we go and, and look at uh, let's see what's going on in Latin America, there's our facts, of course. Fifty percent of the population, about fifty percent of the population, have already access to internet. Right, one hundred and seven percent penetration on mobile, twenty percent penetration on smartphones. Then when we look at our our top tier A one C segments, that means probably more than eighty percent. Uh, 40, uh, 40 billion dollars in e-commerce, which is <coughs> an interesting number that will grow, probably will double in three years. And this is something interesting that we, we were just uh, looking at, is one of every four minutes in Latin America that are spending the internet are in Facebook. We Latin Americans love to gossip, right? We love to <laughs> listen to what everybody else is doing. And if we look at that, just look at five of the top, the top ten countries in, in Facebook, out of the 240, I think it is, are in Latin America. The number one country in the world on Facebook usage is Argentina. Argentines in the room? Where's my You guys Facebook? I bet you do. Maybe you don't, but that, that's okay. No? Uh, there are some people that are taking... I don't think so. But they are talking about you, man. So, but that's very interesting. And, and uh, if you look at this, is this is even more amazing. You know? All this information, the only thing it's telling us is, and, and look at what, what's going on with Brazil. What this is telling us is that there is something out there that we're not necessarily looking at when we're looking at financial transactions that we should be doing it. Because if, if more than uh, a third of the population are doing this, and that's what they do when, when they are on the computer, well, we should, be, we should be there. We should be top of mind. So, What's happening with the financial world when you look at all those trends, which is what Ted was sharing with us? He said something very interesting. It's you don't click on boring, right? And that's why we have, we have iTunes, we have Square, we have Facebook, and all of those are playing a role in the financial world. Uh, who has uh, an iTunes account here? All of you, right? Okay, so you have a, an account with iTunes Bank, actually, because they can easily become a payment mechanism in just one day they can transform themselves into a financial institution and probably the largest financial institution in the world because it will be completely global, completely connected, and completely transactional. And that's what Facebook is all about. Do they have a banking license? Of course they do. Because they're leveraging the license that everybody else is, is offering to us. Something that is happening that we are not necessarily realizing is all this collaboration phase on the digital space. You don't need to have a big um, building branches in order to have a bank. You, can, you only need to have someone letting you use their license and you can have a bank like Simple. Well, some, someone here has a Simple account? I know one that does. All right. So simple is a bank that is actually an application that is linked to a license in, in, a, in a bank and uh, I think it's in Utah. When we look at what happened with, uh, with Square, Square came and created this uh, easy to use um, device to be able to to pay with credit cards or to charge with credit cards. Again, we don't click on boring. We click on things that are that are simple. And, and all this, that what it's telling us is that disruptive innovation is here, and it's here to stay. Of course, this is not coming from financial institutions. This are coming from very young individuals that are transforming the world. This is a, a collaborating and partnership um, environment that is changing the customer's experience and the, is pushing for digitization of finance. So why are we caring about the millennials? Well, in 10 years, which is not that much, 75% are going to be you guys. You're going to be ruling on this. So we need to understand what you're going to be doing so that we can start preparing for that. We obviously um, using that to make business today. And this is not something that we created, right? This is something that probably some other people saw it before. And this is a, an interview in 1990. I was in London. A month ago. Okay, go ahead. I run this fellow who runs our global consumer finance company. And he says to me, well, I'm, I'm working on this project and I'm a mentee. Mentee, he's the CEO. Uh -huh. So what do you mean you're a mentee of what? He said, well, in e-business, I'm not up to speed. He said, in order to get up to speed, I found the brightest young person under 30 in my organization. And I brought them in as a mentor to me. Well, the point of the story was, I was there when we were investing that story. That was one of the best ideas I've heard in years. So I came back. Within 48 hours, 
everyone in our company was looking at who they got for a mentor, who they could get to help them, and we tipped the organization upside down. We now have the youngest and brightest teaching the old. So that's what we're trying to do today, right? We're trying to turn the city upside down with you guys, with the help of all of you, the bright young ones. So uh, when we're thinking about projects, what's going on out there, I think it's extremely interesting in seeing how big this is becoming. And, and this project, has someone seen Project Loom here? Nobody? Really? Okay. Okay, let's go ahead and, and, and play it. Sometimes everyone isn't really everyone. Like when people say, everyone's on the internet. Because the truth is, for each person that can get online, there are two that can't. And when you look closer, that everyone looks even less like everyone. In some places, it's more like one in a thousand. In others, it's one in ten thousand. And in some places, no one's online at all. But what if there was a way to light up the entire globe and finally make all the world's information accessible to all of the world's people? Well, even though today one in three kids can't get to a real secondary school, everyone can have secondary school come to them. In places where there aren't enough doctors, everyone could be helped by doctors in other places. Farmers everywhere could start using better weather data so everyone could enjoy a bigger harvest. And because small businesses that are on the internet grow twice as fast, everyone could create new opportunities for everyone. But how do we bring affordable internet to everyone? Maybe finding an answer starts with looking somewhere new. Like up, and trying something different. Like balloons. Yep, yeah, that's right. Balloons. Because it turns out that if you use balloons, it's faster and easier and cheaper to give everyone the internet than it is to give some people the internet. That's why we're giving it a try. And why there's hope that someday soon, everyone really will mean everyone. So that means that the world is really going to change once everybody has access to the internet. Now, and this is not something that they are just thinking about it, they have already tested and they're working with balloon powered internet. So that's that's in a way the type of projects that are that are happening today. And uh, when we think about creating projects, which is what you're gonna be doing, right? We have to think about uh, what kind of project we want to build and, and how fun does it have to be because we don't click on board, right? Can we go ahead? This is the last one.
Well, the whole point here is that banking could be boring. Something you have to do, you have to go up the stairs because there's the only way to go up, right? But it can also be fun, and that's what we're here for, right? To create something that is fun and then let you do something that you have to do in a fun way. So with that, I think I'm, I'm done. I don't know who comes next. Nobody. All right. <laughs>